You know, there's no economic principle that says that uh, management should be responsive to shareholders. In fact, you can read in you know, texts of business economics that, well, you could just as well have a system in which the management is responsible to s s stakeholders. You know, stakeholders, meaning workers and community, uh, why not? Why shouldn't they be responsible? Of course, this presupposes that there ought to be management, uh, but that's another question. Why should there be management? Uh, why not uh, have the stakeholders run the industry? Well, uh, this is a, a, a phenomenon that's growing. It is. I'm following yeah. it. I know that you are. Gara Paravitz has written about it. Worker co-ops um, appearing across Ohio, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. right here where we are now. One question that I hear is, will change come from changing ownership, even to m worker ownership, if you don't change the profit paradigm? Could you maintain the same kind of exploitative profit system well, under worker ownership? It's a little bit like uh, asking whether shareholder uh, voting is a good idea. Yeah, it's a step. Is the Buffett rule a good idea? Yeah, a small step. I mean, worker ownership within a state capitalist market, semi-market system is better than private ownership, but it has inherent problems. I mean, mar markets have well-known inherent inefficiencies. They're just part of markets. Uh, they're very destructive. I mean, the obvious one is that a, in a market system, a really functioning one, uh, whoever's making the decisions uh, doesn't pay attention to what are called externalities, effects on others. So say, I sell you a car, uh, we, f our eyes are open, we'll make a good deal for, our for ourselves, but we're not asking what's going to, how it's going to affect her. Mm -hmm. And it will, there'll be more congestion, more uh, gas prices will go up, uh, environmental effects and so on. And that multiplies over the whole population. Well, that's pretty serious. Uh, take, say, financial crises. Uh, ever since New Deal regulation was essentially dismantled, uh, there have been regular financial crises. And one of the fundamental reasons it's understood is uh, the fact that, uh, say, the CEO of Goldman Sachs or Citigroup or whatever uh, does not pay attention to what's called systemic risk. So maybe you make a risky investment transaction and you cover your own potential losses, but you don't take into account the fact that uh, if it crashes, it may crash the system, which is what a financial crash is. So, and, and the, the much more serious case of this is the fact is uh, environmental effects. Now, there, in, in the case of financial institutions, when they crash, you can come, the taxpayer comes to the rescue. But if you destroy the environment, nobody's going to come to the rescue. So, sounds like you'd support things like the Cleveland model, where the ownership of the company is actually held by a NGO representing the community as well as workers. That's a step forward, but it also has to go beyond that to dismantle the system of production for a profit rather than production for use. And that means you know, dismantling at least large parts of market systems. Uh, take the most advanced case, Mondragon. Uh, it, uh, it's worker-owned. It's, it's not worker-managed, actually, although the management does come from the workforce often. They uh, exploit workers in South America, you know, they, uh, they do things that are harmful to the society as a whole and so on, and have no choice. I mean, if you're in a system where you must make profit in order to survive, you're compelled to ignore uh, negative externalities, effects on others. That's only one example. The market systems also have a very bad, just kind of psychological effect. I mean, they drive people to a conception of themselves and society in which you're, you're, after, you're only after your own good, you know, not others. And that's extremely harmful. Have you ever felt, tasted, had a sense of a non-market system? Have you ever had a flash of optimism? Oh, this is how we could live. So it, it certainly can be done. And, I, and the biggest I know is Mondragon, but there are many in between. I mean, a, a functioning family, for example, and uh, there are bigger groups, you know, cooperatives are case in point. Uh, right here in Boston, um, this is one of the suburbs about uh, two years ago, I guess, 
the, there was a, a small but a profitable enterprise doing, building some kind of high-tech equipment for airplanes or something. Uh, the multinational who owned it uh, didn't want to keep it on the books. It was profitable, but bothered. So uh, they decided to close it down. The uh, workforce and the union, it was UE, uh, uh, offered to buy it. The community was supportive. Uh, it could have worked if there had been popular support. If there had been an Occupy movement then, I think that would have been a great thing for them to concentrate on. If it had worked, you would have had one of, there are many of them, uh, profitable uh, worker-owned, maybe worker-managed enterprises. Uh, there's a fair amount of that around the country, and there are real examples. I don't see why they shouldn't survive. Of course, they're going to be beaten back. You know, the power systems are not going to want them any more than they want popular democracy, uh, any more than the states in the Middle East and, and the West are going to tolerate the Arab Spring. They're going to try to beat it back. They tried to beat back those sit-in strikes that you talked about early on. What we forget is entire communities showed up to support those workers, get yeah. food in there, make sure yeah. they were protected, including women, as I recall, big cordons of, oh, yeah. of women protecting them from the cops. Go back a century to Homestead, you know, the worker-run communities, towns, had to send in the uh, National Guard to destroy them.